Welcome to Storytime from Space, a project of the Global Space Education Foundation. To learn how you can support this exciting project, please visit storytimefromspace.com. Hello, welcome to Storytime on the International Space Station. I'm Nick Haig, NASA astronaut, and today the book I'd like to read is Curiosity, the story of a Mars rover. You know, this is a really cool book uh, because, you know, right now I'm on the International Space Station and, and we're exploring. It's about the human exploration of space. But one of the things that you do have to know is that we don't just always use humans. Sometimes we need to use robots to do exploration. And so this is a story about a very famous rover that we sent to Mars. We sent the robots so that we can learn about Mars, so that one day we can make it to Mars. And uh, maybe one of you is going to be the first one to put foot on the Martian surface. Anyway, let's read Curiosity, the story of a Mars rover by Marcus Modem. An inscription. To the crew, thank you for inspiring a new generation to look up to the stars. Marcus Modem. Curiosity, the story of a Mars rover by Marcus Modem. Wherever you are in the world right now, I'm a very long way away. I'm not even on the same planet as you. I'm a Mars rover. A rover is a moving robot built to explore far off places, places too far away or dangerous for humans to visit. How did I get there? Why was I sent? This is my story. Humans have always wondered about Earth and its place in the universe. Although scientists have made great discoveries and explained some of the mysteries of space, the planets hold their secrets well. Many questions remain unanswered. Of these, one question intrigues humans above all others. Is there anybody else out there? Scientists decided the best place to look for other life was one of our closest neighboring planets. Mars, the red planet. In addition to being one of our two closest neighboring planets, Mars is the planet in our solar system that is most similar to Earth. Scientists think that in the past, Mars may have had environments similar to the ones on Earth today. Mars is covered in red dust now, but there is evidence that millions of years ago, the planet may have had lakes, flowing rivers, and even great oceans. Like the one right behind me right now. Why does this matter? Because on Earth, water is a necessity for life. However, there is one problem. A trip to Mars can be over 350 million miles long. That's 350 million miles, or 560 million kilometers. A distance much, much further than any human has ever traveled in space. Even with our modern technology, we don't have a practical way to get humans to Mars. The journey would take at least six months, or to get them back. Humans have been able to explore closer to home. On July 20, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon, and Neil Armstrong took one famous step and became the first person to set foot there. For the few hours that he and Buzz Aldrin walked on its surface, people could look up at the moon and that know that someone might be looking back at them. Mars is about 200 times farther from Earth than the moon, a journey that is currently very difficult for humans to undertake. The red planet is also inhospitable, an inhospitable environment. But what if it were possible to send an explorer who didn't need food, water, or oxygen? That's where I come in. Scientists at NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, 
came up with the idea to send robots to Mars in humans' place. The robots would need to be able to move over rough terrain with all the equipment needed to collect data and samples. So scientists began to design rovers like me. The project to build and design Mars rovers was and still is based at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory near Los Angeles, California. I need to be larger and more advanced than any of the other rovers NASA has built before. Previous successful rovers have taken photographs of Mars, giving NASA never-before-seen images. Other missions were orbiters or flybys, flying around or past Mars to gather information without even landing on the planet. By 2007, 39 missions to the Red Planet had been launched, and over half had ended in failure. Some of these earlier missions had become lost in space, while others crashed into Mars, never to be heard from again. The lab where I was built had to be kept as clean as possible. Everyone had to wear white coveralls, which were nicknamed bunny suits. These suits stopped dust and germs from spreading to me and my equipment. The team didn't want to think they had discovered tiny forms of life on Mars, only to realize that it was just Earth bacteria I'd brought with me. Entirely new technologies had to be invented for my mission. I needed to be able to carry a lot of equipment to test what I found on Mars, my own portable laboratory. To give the mission the best chance of being successful, years of testing were needed to make sure everything would work correctly the first time. After all, if something were to go wrong on Mars, no one could come and fix me. NASA ran a competition for members of the public to choose a name for me. Some of the names considered were Adventure, Journey, Pursuit, Vision, and Wonder. The winning entry was submitted by Clara Ma, who was a sixth grader from Kansas. She picked the name Curiosity. And then I was ready to fly to Mars. It was, the, it was best to launch eastward and close to the equator to get as much energy from the Earth's spin as possible. This also meant it was safest to launch where the ocean was to the east, just in case something went wrong. So I had to be taken to Florida to begin my space mission. I boarded a carrier plane and flew from Los Angeles all the way to the Kennedy Space Center. The rocket that would take me into space was waiting for me in Florida, the Atlas V. Rocket is around 200 feet tall, the height of a 19-story building, and it's almost all rocket fuel. This is because it needs to be powerful enough to launch whatever it is carrying, known as its payload, into space. The Atlas V is known as an expendable launch vehicle, which means that parts of it can only be used once. I was placed inside the nose cone at the very top. The nose cone is like a shield that protects the rest of the rocket as it breaks through the Earth's atmosphere. My launch date was chosen carefully so that I had the best chance at a successful launch and the shortest trip possible. Because planets orbit the sun at different speeds and distances, sometimes they are far apart, and other times they are much closer. Every few years, Earth and Mars are lined up so that they are relatively close, allowing missions to reach Mars more quickly and using less fuel. If we had missed this opportunity, the mission would have been delayed for years. Launch day, November 26, 2011, had arrived. I was ready to fly to Mars. In the control room, the team ran through final checks. At last, the rocket was ready for countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Lift off.
The first part of my journey was breaking through Earth's atmosphere and reaching space. Once Atlas V's various boosters had done their job of getting the rocket into space, they broke off and fell safely into the ocean. After 253 days hurtling through space, I finally arrived near Mars, traveling 13,000 miles per hour. Next would be the trickiest part of my entire journey, landing safely. No rover or space mission had ever tried the type of landing I was programmed for. It would take seven minutes from the time I penetrated the atmosphere around Mars until I landed on the surface. The team at NASA called it seven minutes of terror. If I had been landing on Earth, the atmosphere would have slowed down my entry, but Mars has, a much, has much less atmosphere than our home planet. So as soon as I entered the atmosphere, a huge parachute opened slowing me to about 200 miles per hour. I was still moving too fast, so I dropped out of the back shell and for a few seconds I was free falling to the ground. Suddenly the powered descent vehicle, which was holding me, fired eight rockets, slowing me down almost completely. Then I was ready to be lowered to the surface on cables, also known as the sky crane maneuver. Once the descent vehicle detected slack in the cables, it knew I must be on the surface of Mars and released the cables. I had made it. As soon as I was safely on the surface, I sent a message to my NASA team letting them know that I had landed. Because of the huge distance between Mars and the Earth, the message took 15 minutes to get back to Earth. It was a tense time in the control room as everyone waited. Then the words everyone wanted to hear were read out. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. It wasn't just the NASA team who had been watching my landing. All around the world, people tuned in to see if I had arrived safely after my long journey. Crowds gathered in New York's Times Square to watch on a giant screen. It was an exciting but scary time. After all, if just one thing had gone wrong, all contact between me and the team back on Earth would have been lost. When they heard I had landed, some people cheered, others breathed a huge sigh of relief. The next thing I did on Mars was send images of myself back to NASA to make sure I hadn't been damaged during my journey. My landing had been perfect, if a little dusty. The site had been carefully selected by scientists as a place likely to have evidence of water. Now it was time to start looking. Since 2012, I've been exploring Mars. The NASA team looks through my 17 cameras and chooses potential spots on the surface that may have evidence of life. Once something is identified, I move toward it. I can move more than 600 feet per day. NASA also wants to understand how Mars was formed and how it changed over time. The deeper I dig, the more information I can gather. I drill into rocks and scoop up material. Then I test it in my onboard laboratory. Gradually, by piecing together information from different locations, NASA hopes to build a picture of the planet's past and perhaps discover why Mars changed from being a warm planet with water to the cold, dry planet it is today. There are many questions still to be answered. What was Mars like long ago? How suitable was it for life? Did it once support any life forms? The tests I carry out will provide as many answers as possible. Most likely, the discoveries I make will lead to more questions. With space exploration, questions can be just as, as exciting as the answers. Thanks to the curiosity of explorers, Neil Armstrong's footprints are on the moon. And now my wheel tracks are being left on another planet. Perhaps one day soon, footprints from the next generation of explorers will leave their marks here as well. Curiosity is the passion that drives us through our everyday lives. 
we have become explorers and scientists with our need to ask questions and to wonder. We will never know everything there is to know, but with our burning curiosity, we have learned so much. Clara Ma. Well, that's a fabulous book. And I want to thank you for spending time reading Curiosity, the story of a Mars rover with me on the International Space Station. I hope that you join us soon again for another Storytime book or one of our science demonstrations. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Storytime from Space. We hope you enjoyed our story today from the International Space Station. We hope you'll join us again soon for another book reading or for one of our science experiments. Until next time, we look forward to reading together again soon.